So our last reaction mechanism, yay! So again, our last two mechanisms here deal a little bit more with kinds of chemistry that we won't see as much because they're phosphate chemistry, but still nonetheless uh, important. Um, and so I'm going to take just a minute at the beginning and sort of summarize what sort of the first um, 20 and then um, the 21st uh, reaction mechanisms were. So we dealt a lot with some amide linkages. So again, amide linkages are really important for linking amino acids to generate proteins. So we talked about how we form those amide linkages in reaction mechanisms two and three. Remember, reaction mechanism two was where we had a chemically activated um, carboxylic acid, and then reaction mechanism three, we had a biologically activated um, carboxylic acid. And then hydrolysis of those amide linkage we talked about in reaction mechanism 18. And that's going to become important for us to think about how um, enzymes like serine proteases work because those are going to be involved in breaking those uh, amide or peptide linkages. Lots of reaction mechanisms, uh, reaction mechanisms for ketal and acetal linkages. And again, we have twice as many just because we considered um, both of these from the ketone and aldehyde flavors. So really all we had to do with those mechanisms was swap out an H for an R. So those are pretty simple. Ketal and acetal linkages, or we should say hemiacetal and hemiketal uh, hemi linkages, those are important for cyclization of sugars. And then forming the ketal and acetal linkages is, is how we form glycosidic bonds with our sugars. And those glycosidic bonds can be part of hooking sugars together. They can be part of attaching proteins to sugars. We call that glycosylation. It can be part of attaching um, bases to sugars like we have with our DNA and RNA. So again, formation of the hemiacetal and then um, acetal linkages or hemiketal and ketal linkages were in reaction mechanisms four through seven. And then we talked about how we broke those linkages via hydrolysis reactions in reaction mechanisms 10 through 13. So, you know, a good, you know, 30% or more of all of our um, reaction mechanisms were involved in these important carbohydrate linkages. So again, when we study our enzyme catalysis chapter, we're gonna be studying hydrolysis of glycosidic bonds. So we'll study the enzyme ly uh, lysozyme for that process. Ester linkages. So again, ester linkages, we talked about these towards the very end here, forming those ester linkages in reaction mechanism 20 and then hydrolyzing them in reaction mechanism 19. This is actually one of these that we're not going to study from an enzymatic standpoint. We talked about the enzyme esterase that's going to be responsible for hydrolyzing those ester linkages in triglycerides. So we'll talk about those sort of generally, but um, we are actually not going to be studying uh, an enzyme specifically in our enzyme catalysis chapter. And then these last two mechanisms here, reaction mechanism 21, which we just finished, and then 22, which we're going to do now, have to do with phosphodiester linkages. So again, the linkages we see between nucleotides to make either RNA or DNA nucleic acids. So the hydrolysis chemistry we saw in reaction mechanism 21, and we're going to see formation chemistry in this mechanism. We will study hydrolysis chemistry of phosphodiester bonds in our enzyme catalysis chapter. So we're going to study RNase A, and so we'll understand how that enzyme works to hydrolyze the linkage, the phosphodiester linkage in RNA. So just a nice little summary, maybe now sort of in retrospect, you could sort of see that there was a logic and an organization and a system to all of these reaction mechanisms that we did. So lots of words on this. Uh, I apologize, I'm just going to kind of highlight some things here. Um, a lot of times we saw mechanisms where we were reversing things, and that reversing step was, was pretty straightforward, right? We basically just had to take deprotonation steps and made them protonation steps. Nucleophilic attack became a leaving group leaving. And so some of those are pretty straightforward, like we saw with esters and then ketals and acetals. For others, kind of hydrolysis chemistry, um, uh, was maybe pretty straightforward, but creating linkages was challenges. So as an example, when we consider the hydrolysis uh, re, uh, products of hydrolysis reactions of amides, for example, so reaction mechanism 18 is amide hydrolysis. When we looked at what those were, we actually got a carboxylate and a protonated amine. So extremely poor electrophiles in a carboxylate, something that's supposed to be electron poor being a negatively charged species, not a good electrophile. And then to have a nucleophile, you have to have a lone pair of electrons. And so a protonated amine is not going to be a good nucleophile. 
So if you look back, we actually drew the last step of that mechanism using one-way arrows, reminding ourselves that kind of the condensation chemistry, the formation of amide bonds was not going to be easy. So this was all the way back at the beginning of our reaction mechanism series when we talked about creating these linkage. Our first reaction mechanism uh, was on amide bond formation. And reaction mechanism one reminded us that it was really just acid-base chemistry we had to give us carboxylates and protonated amines if we tried to react carboxylic acids with amines. But once we moved to reaction mechanism two, we used an acid anhydride. We chemically activated our carboxylic acid so it could do chemistry. Right? We don't tend to have chemically activated molecules in biochemistry. So in reaction mechanism three, we started learning about how to biologically activate carboxylic acids by attaching an AMP group on it. And in essence, we really just added a good leaving group there. So we're gonna utilize that same strategy for our last mechanism here. And again, for simplicity, and we're not gonna really have this be a topic that we cover in lecture. We're not going to talk about the synthesis of nucleic acids. We're simply just gonna say that we activate our phosphate ester by adding a good leaving group. Again, I do want you to remember that common good leaving groups include nucleotide derivatives like we saw in reaction mechanism three, that is putting on an AMP group, or again, pyrophosphate, as we're gonna see here, is going to be an important good leaving group. All right, so I'm gonna have two mechanisms that I'm gonna draw here. The first one is gonna be our general mechanism that just kind of shows this chemistry by taking, that takes an alcohol and um, reacts it with an activated phosphate ester. So I'm gonna draw first my phosphate ester. So again, here's my phosphate. And we're making it into an activated group because we're adding uh, a good leaving group. And we highlighted that this can be an OAMP group, maybe it's a pyrophosphate group, but we just have something that's a good leaving group. And we're gonna have this then react with our alcohol. Again, chemistry we're going to model with our phosphate chemistry is parallel to what we saw with carbonyl chemistry, and that is we generate this intermediate, in this case it's a pentacoordinate intermediate, Now, if you wanted to show deprotonation of this alcohol nucleophile as it came in, that wouldn't be inappropriate. Again, we, we've sort of highlighted in a few mechanisms uh, the strategy of combining sort of deprotonation and nucleophilic attack steps um, in the sort of the same mechanistic step, and that's okay. So if you wanted to sort of have combined those together, that would be okay. We get to this um, pentacoordinate intermediate that now has our leaving group being the best leaving group for uh, the decomposition of this pentacoordinate intermediate. So again, decomposition of this has the leaving group to part. And we're not showing anything specific about why that's a good leaving group. Remember, when we have something that's a good leaving group, it's a good leaving group because it's able to take these electrons that is going to go with it, giving it a negative charge, and help stabilize that. So anything that can help either by inductive electron withdrawal or by resonance can sort of help with that chemistry. And then again, that leaving group, leaving group with a negative charge. Things that are good leaving groups, we're going to say are weak or stable conjugate bases. I'm going to write that down here. Weak or stable conjugate bases. So again, if it's a weak or stable conjugate base, that means it's okay having that negative charge, and that means it's fine sort of existing in this flavor. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. That's the mechanism that we're going to have there for generating our, um, our phosphodiester linkage. So again, we've created this phosphate, uh, phosphodiester linkage. What I'm going to highlight now is sort of the biochemical application of this. Again, we're not necessarily going to see a lot of phosphodiester formation chemistry. We're not going to talk about nucleotide synthesis, uh, but I did want to show you kind of how this happens. It's kind of a pretty cool mechanism to consider. It's sort of related to things that I know you've already learned about because we had to learn how to draw a phosphodiester bond. So I'm gonna highlight here, if we've got sort of the five prime end of a growing nucleotide polymer here, or nucleic acid polymer. We've got our base that we have here. Let's make it DNA, 
and then we're going to have a hydroxyl group at the three prime position. So this is our growing DNA polymer. What we're going to attach this to is a nucleotide triphosphate. Triphosphate, NTPs, are the building blocks of nucleic acids. So I'm going to draw, and it's going to take me a little bit of time to draw this out because I have to draw out all of these phosphates, or phosphorus atoms. And again, another molecule that you had to know how to draw, because one of the things you needed to know how to do was be able to draw ATP. So this is going to be the second base that we're going to be adding. All right. So just to highlight, took me a little while to draw that, but we've got triphosphate, so three phosphate groups hooked together here. This is going to be the second base that we're going to add in this growing chain. When we grow and synthesize DNA, we grow it from the five prime to the three prime end. So this is going to be the nucleophile that we're going to have here, and it's going to nucleophilically attack at this phosphorus. This is what we refer to as the alpha phosphorus. So this is alpha, beta, and gamma phosphates on an NTP. So this guy is a nucleotide triphosphate. So again, what we're going to see here is our good leaving group is going to be pyrophosphate that we have here. Now to kind of simplify this mechanism only because this is an example and I just kind of want to highlight what's going on. I'm going to do this in two different colors to show what the two different mechanistic steps would be. So again, nucleophilic attack here on our phosphorus generating our pentacoordinate intermediate. So this is going to be sort of our first mechanistic step. Second mechanistic step would be decomposition of that pentacoordinate intermediate with departure of what would be the best leaving group, which in this case is going to be our pyrophosphate. So that's the second mechanistic step. Remember, we highlighted before that sometimes we might show kind of simplifying or mechanisms that are not truly mechanisms, but they're just kind of highlighting the electron movement that's going on. It's kind of what's happening here. So again, we're going to have this pyrophosphate group sort of leave. So I'm going to draw that pyrophosphate group here. One of the things we talked about with pyrophosphate is there's lots of pyrophosphatase enzyme in your body. Phosphatase. There's lots of pyrophosphatase, which is the enzyme that is going to break apart this linkage right here and generate two inorganic phosphates. And again, that is a completely irreversible process in your body. And that's one of those things that helps drive reactions like this to completion. Because if we remove this as a good leaving group and then we fully remove it from our equilibrium, this reaction really can't go backwards because there's never going to be in any pyrophosphate around to do so. So this helps drive reactions like this to completion. So let's go ahead and just kind of draw what our final product is. And this is going to look very similar because this is sort of what you had to learn how to draw when you had to draw a little piece, a little dinucleotide um, of RNA or DNA. So I'm going to get this a little bit smaller here so I can fit it here. So this is base one. This is DNA. Here is our phosphodiester bond. And then base two hydrogen. And then we've got our three prime hydroxyl group that's ready for another round of this chemistry to attach on the next base. Just as a little reminder, in lab we talked about how Sanger sequencing works. And Sanger sequencing works by having a dideoxynucleotide triphosphate, which means this is a hydrogen rather than an OH group. And when this is a hydrogen rather than an OH group here in this position, that means we don't have this nucleophile. So we can't do this coupling chemistry. So we do not grow our DNA polymer. 
Well, I can't believe that our reaction mechanisms are done. You made it all the way through. And now we're gonna have a lot of fun as we put these reaction mechanisms into play as we learn about enzyme catalysis and we learn about sort of some of the main metabolic pathways of uh, carbohydrate, lipid, and um, protein metabolism.